If someone has actually never seen any of your work before, what is the first thing you want them watching and why? I would have them start at the beginning, just in the order I made them, because uh, I think, you know, that's been my journey as a filmmaker. In every film, I've learned uh, something new and, and tried to apply that to the next one. So um, that's, I guess that's, I guess that's my answer. Which of the films changed the most in the editing room? You know what, gosh, they're all, I feel like they're all kind of really true to the script. I mean, um, we certainly honed this one, uh, uh, you know, cause we had, we didn't have the time pressure at the end. Um, but, uh, yeah, they all stayed pretty true. You know, I've never had a film that like went through a, a massive restructure or, you know, rebuild at the end. Um, if you get the financing to make anything you want, uh, what would you make and why? You know, when I was a kid uh, or in high school, I loved the book, The Fountainhead. Uh, and, you know, making that as a, like a period 1930s film would be pretty epic. So I read that you went to Paris when Tom was uh, filming Mission yep. to pitch him on, you know, on Top Gun Maverick. How much did you, had you talked previously about the project or was this like your first time actually talking to him? You know, Tom says we, we talked about it on Oblivion, uh, but it was probably very general and very, you know, very high level. Um, uh, Tom was shooting Mission. It was Jerry who called me in um, and they had a script they had been working on, which I read and it, and it gave me, uh, you know, uh, I had some ideas about how I would do it differently, I guess I would say. And when I pitched Jerry kind of my approach, he said, well, we got to go you got to talk to Tom about this directly. So let's go to Paris. He was shooting mission six. Uh, and we went out there and uh, we found, you know, a half hour break in the day. Um, McHugh was very generous to let Tom go for a half hour. And um, I think what I didn't realize, and Jerry was probably smart not to tell me was that Tom really didn't want to do another Top Gun movie. Uh, I think he walked into that room uh, prepared to say thank you for coming all this way and I appreciate it, but you know, I'm not interested in making another movie. Um, and then uh, at the end of that meeting, he, uh, he picked up the phone and he called the head of the studio and said, uh, we're making another Top Gun. So that was a pretty, <laughs> that was a pretty epic meeting uh, and pretty amazing to see, you know, that level of power uh, on display. What was it like, though, had you been like when you're going to sit down with Tom and obviously you've worked with him before, are you actually like practicing your pitch on the plane when you're flying over or are you just thinking about it and how you're going to, you know what I mean? I was very more conversational. I mean, I had kind of my four big kind of ideas um, that I wanted to talk through. I had, you know, I had some visuals. I had some videos. Um, I had a poster. I had a title. You know, I had kind of like the big stuff, but it was really the the most important thing was the story. And it was this character journey of Maverick and what it was going to be. I mean, that was the that was the thing I think that really got him hooked was there was finally something that he could latch on to emotionally, which was this, you know, this reconciliation with um, with Goose's son. I mean, that was the you know, that drew on what was most powerful and people remembered the most from the first film, which is that friendship with Goose. And then, you, you know, I just like looking at that little kid with the cowboy hat sitting on the piano in that scene in the first movie and thinking about him growing up and, and, and what that would mean if he became a naval aviator and Maverick had to send him into combat, um, what that would feel like. And I think that's where Tom finally said, you know what, that's it. That's what, that's what's worth coming back for. You obviously had your release date punted about 27 times. And I'm, and I'm just curious, when you have that much more time, are you going back into the edit, uh, like in 2021, 2022? Or what, when did you actually finish this movie? We finished the cut in 2020, pretty close to when the movie was supposed to come out originally. Um, you know, then we all went off and made other films, um, which is good. We all stayed busy. Uh, certainly we had time to do a couple little finishing touches to the, the mix and the picture. Um, we didn't have to rush anything. Like I, I'm, 
in hindsight, that extra time was good to just make sure it was exactly as we wanted. Uh, but the cut was locked. I mean, the, the movie, even from the very first preview, was always, uh, always felt like it was on really solid ground, you know? A lot of people are very excited about Lady Gaga contributing a song to the soundtrack. Had you gotten her for the soundtrack way back when, or was this a new addition in the last like year? No, this was back in 2019. Um, we first, uh, she wrote the song and, and we heard it played at the uh, record label went down there and, and they played it for us, which is nerve right, nerve wracking, as Jerry would say, because they're about to play you a song from a superstar. And what if you don't like it? You know, what do you say? And uh, luckily, you know, from the first time we heard it, we were like, that's it. You know, somehow she just wrote a classic melody that um, that that works. And then when Hans Zimmer heard it, he, you know, orchestrated the score, uh, the love theme around that melody. So it it's. Um, it was pretty amazing to uh, to see how powerful that song is and how he was able to weave it into the score. Were you nervous at all? Because obviously this song has been done for a while. Have you been like dreading this song leaking prior to the movie coming out? Uh, no, because, you know, you're you're always sitting on stuff. You know, you're sitting on these files and, and the picture and, and the trailers. Um, so, uh, no, I mean, it's like you know, we're all professionals. We know how that stuff needs to be handled. And and, you know, you're not blasting it in your car, you know, out in public or, um, but I'm excited that people are finally going to get to hear it. Uh, yeah. I'm still waiting to hear the unreleased Daft Punk songs from uh, Tron legacy. Just throwing next that out time there. I see you next time I see you, we'll, we, we can listen to those together. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so um, you and Tom clearly have a great working relationship uh, during the making of Maverick or even in the last year or two, have you guys had those conversations of, so what are we going to do next? I mean, I'm always thinking about it. Obviously, having that relationship is a pretty amazing thing. Um, it's just about figuring out like what would what's that story? You know, he uh, he's obviously got his plate full with missions for the next year or two, uh, and then you know I hear he's going to space after that. Uh, so he's a busy guy, but um, I'm always you know thinking about looking for something that would be great to work with him on. I'm always amazed that that Tom is able to get insurance on his movies. Um, so are you ever like, do you get involved in those conversations with the studio and insurance? Or are you sort of like, you got it, right? Okay, let's never, go film. Yeah. I never ask. I just, you know, I just shoot. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't ask those questions. Um, obviously, Tony Scott directed the first one. And I am, um, you obviously have to balance the nostalgia while also making your own movie. And I'm specifically talking about shots that could be inspired by Tony Scott. So can you sort of talk about where that line was when you were directing, like, oh, I want to homage Tony. I want to nod to Tony. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I've never used like sunset grads in my, in my footage before. That's certainly a, a Tony Scott thing. And, you know, Tony created a, a world. It's like, the, it's like the Top Gun cinematic universe where the sun is always setting. Everything's backlit. Everyone looks great. You know, it's like, it's, it's a look and a feel. And I wanted this film, you know, just as Maverick gets called back to Top Gun, I really wanted the audience to feel like they were going back to Top Gun as well. Um, so that first, you know, five minutes of the movie tells you you're in a Top Gun film, but then you know, we get into that opening sequence and it becomes its own thing. You know, it becomes its own film um, that looks very different. Uh, and the last half hour of the film looks, takes that Top Gun aesthetic and flips it on its head and becomes something totally opposite. So um, I wanted it to feel like a Top Gun movie. The first movie set the bar very, very high, you know, cinematically. Uh, and Claudio and I knew that, you know, we'd have to meet that bar and try to exceed it with some of this aerial photography. So that's you know, we did our best. And, you know, I guess the audience will decide if we were successful. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, talk a little bit about working actually with Claudio on um, like the color scheme that you were going for and the, the look you were going for. Um, and, you know, just collaborating with him on the cinematography. Yeah, no, we, uh, like I said, we wanted it to feel like, I, I wanted people to be able to put the first movie up in our movie and feel like not that it's, that it's the same, you know, we don't want the cover band version of Top Gun but that it feels like it's in the same universe. So, um, you know, we shot with the very, the long lenses on the ground. 
uh, the wide angles up in the sky. You know, we have those deep shadows, um, that grade that just feels like uh, the first film. We actually uh, developed a film grain that is a close match to the film stock that was used on the first film, even though we shot digitally. Um, so I haven't added, you know, I haven't used film grain in a film I've done before, but for this one, it just made sense because it didn't really feel like Top Gun until you had that on there. Um, and it just, I just wanted it to feel uh, like a Top Gun film. And there's some of those, you know, things that do that. Um, it was fun. It was fun to, you know, live in that universe. How did you and Claudio decide what cameras you wanted to use? I know, I believe you shot some IMAX stuff. Um, and can you sort of talk about the cameras you chose to use on the film? Yeah, well, we, um, Claudio and I had been working with Sony on a new prototype camera. We had just shot a short film called The Dig with something new called the Sony Venice, um, which is a 6K, very high quality camera that is certified by M IMAX as being, it's not made by IMAX, but it, it's IMAX quality and that'll hold up at, on a hundred foot screen. Uh, and then uh, we worked with them. They were, they were developing a prototype where you can take the Venice camera and split it into two pieces so that the sensor and the lens is one piece. And then you have a fiber optic cable connecting you to the recorder, which is separate. And what that allows is the actual sensor and camera can be a very small box um, that allows you to put it in very small places. So we worked closely with the Navy to get clearance to put, um, at first we wanted to get one, then two, then four, and then we finally end up with six uh, in, the, in the cockpit um, by taking out all this other equipment they didn't need. And uh, we were able to just capture, you know, all those interiors for real, which is, you know, you just can't fake that. You can't fake the forces on your body and the way the light moves around the canopy and the the way the terrain sweeps by the, the lens. Um, we got that all for real. And, uh, you know, it just, it just, it's a, it's an old school way of making a film, but with, you know, new technology. I don't know how many of these cameras are actually in existence. Like, do they have tons of these cameras or was. Do, yeah. We were the first to use it, but now they're widely used. And in fact, they've just come out with the Venice two which is a successor. So we're going to look, you know, obviously start looking at that and see what, see what that's like. For me, seeing Val Kilmer in the movie meant a lot. And I'm, yeah. and I'm, can you sort of talk about getting to work with Val and just making sure he was in the movie? Yeah, we all uh, wanted to figure out a way for Iceman to be in the film. Uh, Val came in and met with Jerry and I, and he, um, he actually had the idea of how to integrate himself into the film, which was incredible. And, uh, you know, to work with someone like him of his caliber, you know, some of my favorite characters, you know, like his character in Heat is one of my all time favorites uh, to get to work with him uh, in one of his most iconic roles. And then to be able to, to do a scene with him and Tom together uh, and see that relationship, which has developed, you know, over the last 35 years, that rivalry between the characters to become the friendship it is in this film. Um, it's very emotional to be there for, to, to film that scene. But, uh, you know, it's also one of my favorite to watch in the, in the movie. I don't want to spoil it, but there's a great line at the end of that sequence. Um, was that who came up with that line? Cause it's so good. That was a line in the script, uh, that, um, we loved and we, you know, we played around at the scene. We played with versions that had it out and had it in. And, um, I'm so glad we put it in because, you know, I was at CinemaCon. Uh, and uh, it was great just to see how the audience reacted. Oh, it a hundred percent. The obviously the Navy, uh, you needed the Navy to sign off on this movie. Um, was it one of these things where when you guys approached them, it was it almost like, oh, you're making a Top Gun sequel? Yes. Yes, on the first movie, it wasn't that way, from what I understand with Jerry. Um, but you know, given how the first movie was received and what it did for the Navy. I'm the benefit of was being able to walk in there and have them say, yes, what would you like? Where would you like to shoot? What do you need? And um, so we got to shoot not only on the carrier and on the bases that you would expect, but we got to shoot in some places that, you know, people would never get to see, you know, the public never gets to see uh, top secret spaces. Um, 
Uh, so it was, it was a pretty amazing uh, opportunity. Was there anything that you guys asked for that they actually said, this is a little too top secret. We, we can't do that. Uh, yeah, I, I went to some, there were a couple of times where uh, I took some pictures that um, had to be erased off my camera. Um, things like that, you know, wandering around some of these spaces, but, uh, but uh, you know, they did a good job of kind of keeping the secret stuff secret. And, uh, and, you know, we got to put our, our stuff in place. So you shot on the Roosevelt um, and uh, I believe that was the name of the ship. I'm, I'm shot on both. We shot the Roosevelt and on the Lincoln. So my question is with, when you're shooting on those kinds of uh, ships, uh, you know, um, is there parameters before you step on foot on, on the boats that basically it's like you have three days or you can shoot this, you know, um, could you sort of explain that? Yeah, we, uh, we were on uh, uh, the Roosevelt for two, we were on the Lincoln for a few days and then we were on the Roosevelt for two weeks. Um, basically, you know, they were in the middle of doing their training operations. Uh, so, um, there were windows during the day where they had full on flight operations going, where we could shoot from certain places to get that footage. Uh, but between their flight operations, when the deck was quiet was when we could go out and do our scenes, um, that we needed to do. Uh, and then there were times where, you know, they were practicing catapult launches where, you know, we were able to get Tom in the plane and, you know, we launched him off that carrier, I think four or five times. Uh, and to capture that in camera, you know, you obviously you see it in the trailer, you see it in the film. Um, it was a very difficult environment to work in. I mean, my bunk was right under the, uh, where the wire was that catches the plane. So all night long, and they're running night ops all night. So, you know, you're not getting any sleep, you're working long days, uh, but there's just no replacement for being on the real thing. Yeah. Well, the footage of Tom taking off is like jaw dropping. At what point did you realize, oh, oh, wow, this is really going to look good. Uh, you know, I think our first aerial test that we did with Tom, um, we did a test day right at the beginning of the shoot just to kind of work out the kinks. And we sent him up with a Top Gun pilot to fly uh, some of the low level training routes around Fallon, Nevada, uh, and which eventually became that sequence in the middle of the film where Maverick flies the, the, the route alone. Um, and when that footage came back, um, uh, I think we all knew we had something special. I believe, and I read, I could be wrong, that at some points you had 27 cameras going. Um, when, when did you have 27 cameras? Was that on the boats? No, that was probably out in Fallon when we were running, uh, we were running two cameras with actors in them, or sorry, two airplanes with camera with actors in them, six cameras each. So that's 12 cameras on actor interiors. We were probably running two jets with exterior cameras, two each. So that's another four. Then we had, you know, probably two or three ground units, which are two cameras each shooting ground to air. Then we had an air to air unit, um, which is either jet to jet or helicopter to jet. Uh, and then I may have had some cameras on the runway too, doing takeoffs and landings. So, yeah, I think there was a day where um, just because of all the activity that was going on, uh, we, we had that many cameras and then obviously Eddie Hamilton in the trailer, just getting that amount of footage in, it was just nonstop, you know, just combing through it all. Uh, it was pretty epic. That, that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you, I read that you had as much footage as Lord of the Rings, you know, making this movie. How the hell do you edit something like that when you have so much footage of flying and so many cameras capturing great looks? You know what I mean? Like where, how do you figure that out? Like, because I'm sure you have multiple shots that look great. Yeah, no, you're, you're combing through it all. You're looking for those moments. Like it could be a second where the sun glints off the lens, you know, on a shot on the belly of the plane and the vapes are coming off the wings and you just get like those moments that are so special and you're just coming through, you find that, you put it in a bin, save it. And then you, you know, scroll through the next 45 minutes till you get another one. Um, so like I said, we had an incredible editorial team, Eddie Hamilton, uh, who's uh, just an incredible editor, uh, spent, I think the whole summer of, 2019 basically assembling that third act sequence just the first assembly took him like three months to put the, the first pass at that together uh, you know i like talking about editing did you i know i think the movie's a little over two hours i apologize i don't know the final runtime yep. what, what was like your first cut did you have an original director's cut that was like two and a half hours or was it always about 
two hours. No, we we didn't. I didn't do a director's cut. We really just started putting the movie together um, as we shot it. Um, so I think you know by the time we had finished shooting, we just had a a film, a uh, first pass. It was probably two thirty five, I would say, um, uh, to have everything in there. Um, but very quickly we were, you know, cutting it down. And, and, and so, uh, there's a couple scenes, you know, they're left out. There's a couple, like there's a shot in the tra the first trailer of Maverick looking up at the F-14 on the stick, things like that, that didn't make it in. Um, but for the most part, it was just about, you know, the shot or the scene had to be pretty good to, to make it into this cut. I would imagine that the theatrical release is your cut, your director's cut. Is there for the Blu-ray, or maybe I'm, I'm just asking, but for the Blu-ray, are you going to include like a longer cut of the film or is it just deleted scenes? You know, I'm, I don't know if we've decided what we're going to put on the Blu-ray yet. Um, there, I think there will only be one cut. This is the best cut, you know, we could come up with. There aren't multiple cuts. There's not extended versions. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we're going to do those other scenes or not. Tom has this great chemistry with Jennifer Connelly in the movie. Like it's, it's just really good. Was that, um, did you guys do some sort of rehearsals or was that just because they're great actors? Uh, they're great actors. Um, they've both been working a long time. They've kind of both grew up in the business. Jen's maybe been working longer than Tom because she started in Once Upon a Time in America. Um, that was her first film. So, you know, I had just done a movie with Jen, uh, and just had an incredible experience working with her. And I thought that she would make a great Penny Benjamin. It's amazing. They had never crossed paths in their careers. Um, and uh, yeah, from the first moment, you know, they were together, I was like, this is, this is going to be great. Um, so uh, yeah, she's, she's fantastic in the film. When you think back on the making of the film, I'm sure there was a million tough days or days where you thought, I don't know how we're getting through this but what's like a day or two that you really thought we're not going to get through this? Like, I don't know how we're getting these shots. You wouldn't believe this. The aerial stuff was, was really, really tough and challenging to get, but one of the hardest scenes to get because it was largely had factors that are out of my control was the sailing sequence with uh, when Penny and Maverick go out on that racing boat. Um, the first two times I tried to shoot it, we had no wind. So it was me, Jen and Tom sitting on this, boat out in the middle of the San Diego Bay, you know, with like nothing happening. It was like the worst. Uh, and there's nothing we could do about it because um, the weather wasn't cooperating. So we ended up after two times striking out with wind, uh, we went up to San Francisco and shot that scene in the San Francisco Bay where it's windy all the time, apparently. And, uh, and we had everything, but you know, if you see that scene, it's like, it's uh, it's the real deal, you know. It's Jen and Tom out on this racing boat, and our the water's coming up over the camera housings, and and uh, I'm on another boat with Claudio next to it, you know, trying to uh, to film it with a big arm, and we've got a helicopter going around, and that was that was a challenge, but um, you know, it was a it was definitely a, a memorable one for me. Yeah, when I was watching it, I was like, oh, those are real waves. This is the real, you know, it looks the real for deal. real. Yeah. Yo, 100%. Um, so I heard that you might be doing some F1 movie, uh, perhaps down the road this year. I'm not 100%. What, what are you, is this movie happening? What are you allowed to say about it? It's really early, so I can't say too much about it other than, you know, I, I really love these kind of grounded stories that, you know, happen in our world. I'm, I'm interested in making a movie for the big screen, you know, movie that has to be seen on the biggest screen possible. Um, so, you know, I've always wanted to make a racing movie. I think, as I told you last time we did one of these, I got, uh, pretty close, uh, on go like hell, which eventually became Ford Ferrari. Uh, that was always the movie, you know, one of those that got away and, um, I wanted to make a racing film, a very authentic, great racing film for a long time. And so we're, we're working on it right now and, you know, fingers crossed, we'll be shooting it sometime next year. Is it one of these things where it's going to be the real beneficiary of what you learned on Top Gun in terms of filming with the aerial sequences and the, the smaller cameras? Oh, for sure. You know, like I said, every movie for me is a learning experience that I can apply to the next one. And what I learned on Top Gun is is incredible. And, and so, yeah, definitely thinking about how to take 
all the camera stuff that we developed on this to the next level. Uh, what's interesting is most people have a, a year or two break between their projects. Um, and you have a movie coming out like weeks after Top Gun called Spiderhead. Yeah. Um, for people that are not familiar with it, um, what what is it about? What what are you excited for people to see in it? Yeah, what I like about Spiderhead is it's a uh, it's not you know based on any real known IP. It, it's a, a short story by an author named George Saunders that was published in the New Yorker, um, and it was a movie that we shot in Australia with Chris Hemsworth and Miles Teller and Jeremy Smollett. Um, shot right in the heart of the pandemic um, when everything was locked down. Uh, doesn't fit in any box um, and uh, is you know was really fun for me. You know, it's fun for me to do something big. And then something a little bit smaller and a little bit more different, and uh, that certainly checked that box. I'm so curious about casting on on going back to Top Gun for a second. Um, how do you figure out with casting and like some of the smaller roles, not that are obviously not Tom? Can you sort of talk about um, how you did that? And I would imagine there was just a lot of interest from a lot of parties that wanted to be a part of this film. Yeah, no, I had a great casting director, Denise Chamian, on it, um, and she you know, was pulling faces and people that I had, hadn't seen before or wasn't familiar with. Um, some people dropped out when I explained to them how we were going to shoot the movie, you know, uh, that we were shooting it for real uh, and they'd be in, you know, real fighter jets. Um, but basically what I would do is I would look at all the faces, you know, read them, narrow it down to kind of my top two or three. And then I would play the, uh, sit down with Jerry and Tom and play the tape with them when it came down to the final two choices and, you know, drawing on their combined, you know, 80 years of experience uh, was able to kind of get the final selections. And obviously, you know, I think you'll agree the the casting worked out. We got a great young cast. The, the chemistry you feel between them was, was authentic. It was just like that off screen. Uh, we had so much fun making the movie. That note, I am out of time. Okay. I will I will just say, seriously, <laughs> congratulations on the movie. Uh, and obviously, I want it to be a huge hit for you. And thank you for giving me your time. Thank you, man. Look forward to seeing you soon.